Thank you for that very warm and laudatory uh, introduction. Uh, I should begin by saying I am I'm not a doctor. I, at some point in my career, I, 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 I gambled uh, my, uh, my possible PhD on a fight between uh, Muhammad Ali and uh, Joe Frazier back in 1970. And uh, unfortunately, Muhammad Ali lost that fight, and uh, that was the end of one stage of my uh, academic career. Uh, but it led to other things. Um, I'm not going to talk to you tonight about Northern Ireland, where I've worked. I'm not going to talk to you about South Africa. I'm not going to talk to you about Iraq or our most recent um, venture where we brought uh, uh, eight people from five different divided cities, um, Mitrovica in Kosovo and Serbia, uh, Nicosia in Turkey and Cyprus, uh, uh, Derry in London, Derry, uh, Kirkuk, uh, together to consider forming a, a forum, a permanent forum for cities in transition. And at the end of three days uh, of intense conversation among themselves, intense sharing of their respective narratives of the conflicts in their cities over the decades. And they did agree uh, to form a permanent forum that will uh, each year meet in one of the cities. Uh, that city will act as host and invite delegations of uh, 10 or 12 people from each of the other cities and they will all learn from each other as they move in this kind of uh, rotating process and then we will invite other cities in so there will be an expanding pool of knowledge and learning uh, among divided cities. So um, if I were to characterize my work in any way it would be in two words, about divided societies, how they work, how they don't work, how divided people share or don't share their experiences, how they hate each other, how they other each other, uh, how they put barriers in the way of becoming a single community. And the Indeed, beauty of two weeks ago at the, this conference in, um, at uh, UMass Boston um, was that uh, Mitrovica, and uh, many of you probably haven't heard of Mitrovica, but Mitrovica is like the last scab in the Balkans. Um, if you recall the uh, NATO bombings and the US bombings of Belgrade in 1999, uh, brought that conflict between Serbia and Kosovo to a halt. Uh, but since then, the status of Kosovo has been in a limbo uh, uh, until uh, Marti Atasari, the recent uh, Nobel Prize win winner, uh, came up with a plan. And the plan was that Kosovo would be an independent country, uh, independent from Serbia. but one town at the very tip of Kosovo called Mitrovica uh, was a town that was divided between um, Albanians or, or Kosovars and, uh, and Serbs and uh, the Serbs immediately rejected any association with this new state and in a very quick movement uh, all the Serbs on the south side of a river called the River Ibar moved to the north side into Serbia and all the Albanians on the north side moved down into the south side. So the existing situation today is that you had Kosovo recognized by the EU and by the US but not by the United Nations and Serbia uh, recognized by the rest of the countries in the world. Uh, the status of Kosovo is that it is now divided into two municipalities, 
the municipality on the south side of the river Ibar is run by Albanians and the municipality on the north side of the river is run by Serbs. And this bridge that is no longer than double the length of this room uh, separates the two. And the mayors and the municipalities on both sides don't recognize each other's existence. You have a huge uh, UN presence. It's called uh, uh, UNMIC, uh, uh, one of those acronyms that the United Nations uses to conceal what it's really up to or what it's not up to. Uh, but they are there to keep the peace between the Serbs and the Albanians in case one or the other crosses the bridge. No one does. So, uh, on the second day of this conference, um, I had gone there to invite both cities, and when I talked to the mayor on the uh, northern side of the, uh, the river, he said he, he wasn't coming if he had to talk to anybody from the south side. And I said, that's fine. You can talk to the people from Derry and Belfast and um, Nicosia and from Kirkuk. You can talk to any of the people from the south side of uh, Mitrovica at all. And he said, okay, I'll come. And on the second day of the um, conference, after all of these countries had exchanged their stories with each other, uh, the narratives of their conflicts and how they had emerged from conflict. And the mayor of uh, Mitrovica on the Albanian side, the Kosovo side, looked across the table at his offset and he said, I have traveled 7,000 miles to cross a bridge of 100 feet. And after they had agreed to form this permanent forum, the two mayors from Mitrovica came to me and said they would like to host the first conference in 2010 and to host it as a single city. And that is um, a remarkable breakthrough and uh, our next task is to make sure that they indeed are able to do that. But such is the power of, of sharing. Now, what I'm going, I'll give you that kind of other context to prepare you, as it were, for what I'm going to do. Um, because what I'm going to do is to have a conversation between Jesus Christ and myself. And I play Jesus Christ and I play myself. So it's very different. I've never tried anything like this in my life before. And if you, if you all start streaming for the door after five minutes, I won't take it personally. I will, I will just say, maybe I should have just stuck with formal lecturing and not ventured out into the field of a Brian or Friel or a, a Sean O'Casey or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, Professor Groom talked about uh, uh, the people who come out of Ireland. And when he was saying that, uh, it reminded me of a, a famous uh, four lines from William Butler Yeats, uh, which said, Out of Ireland do I come, great hatred, little room maimed us at the start. I'll take that as my starting point. When I'm playing God, I will use an accent like this. When I'm playing myself, I might revert a bit to my vernacular Dublin accent so that those of you who are not German, uh, who are Irish, uh, will note at least there's a change in the tone of my accent.
We met as it happened in Harvard Square, at the top of the stairwell to the red line where you come face to face with the hordes of homeless, the insanely indigenous, professional beggars, whores masquerading as students, students masquerading as whores, pimps, pedophiles, fakes, phonies, and the phantomless, the aimless and lost, the human imposters, a great gluttonous mob of humanity in a single congregation drawn to the distinguished ambience of Harvard University, sure that the generosity of its elite student population will empathize with their collective plight, and yes, ignore them concerned as all elites are with the infinite permutations of global possibilities on which the theories of their lives are built. I kind of bumped into him, the greatest spin master of them all, the Christ celebrity. Now, if I'd been in a car, you might say I'd sideswiped him, but I was walking and he was preaching, as always. And since it was Harvard Square, of course, no one was taking any notice of him. I hadn't seen him since my last encounter with LSD, a mind-building hallucinogen and preferred drug of choice for many during the counterculture of the late 1960s and early 70s when we took our marching orders from the late great Hunter Thompson who taught us fear and loathing and that wild turkey or any mind-bending substance was an antidote to life. But the counterculture took a right-wing turn. These chemicals snorted, sniffed, or injected into every artifice the body could offer, and mainstreamed or streamlined and produced a generation of CEOs to grace the boardrooms of AIG, Bank of America, Citicorp, Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley, and the vice presidential counter-terrorism chambers of Dick Cheney. Even countercultures with love ends and kill the pig sloganeering can take the most expected turns. One of his little gimmicks to amuse himself at guffaws of godly mirth. But a Friday evening, soft drizzling rain, I was coming from nowhere, going nowhere, I, I was just bare, kind of an impromptu being there. Jerry Kaczynski would understand. Kurt Vonnegut would surely get the picture. When? God knows when. I had been nursing figures in my head for some time. You might say obsessing. A kind of social disorder that a random genetic predisposition many of us are infected with in varying degrees of intensity. I've been counting the dead of the last century. Some people do crossword puzzles or Sudoku. Me? I do dead as in war dead, slaughtered, massacred, butchered, the decrepitude of decaying bodies on little remembered battlefields, the last farts that empty the bowels when one witheringly accurate blast leaves no memory for a last thought, just perfunctory expulsion of the last bodily bowel movements. Last century's count was pretty awesome a tribute to our seemingly infinite capacity to devise new ways of obliterating ourselves, and if we alone, and if it alone had become life's overriding purpose, our ultimate accomplishment, weapons of mass destruction that if used, annihilate every living being and deplete the planet of man. Note, not life, just man, remember, we are just a species. Life will go on without us. But here's what was on my mind that fateful evening. From where the tea arrives on the track to Harvard Square to the lobby, it takes 45 seconds at a brisk pace if you exit from the last carriage on the train. Two minutes and five seconds if you exit from the first. Now since the train has seven carriages and each is 20 feet long and it takes eight seconds to walk 20 feet, then the excess time it takes to get to the lobby is due to people interference. As people tumble out of the carriages in front of you, small inconvenient masses walking at random paces, veering into open spaces, the time to navigate, one minute and 35 seconds. 
Now, you in the audience have the right to ask, Key, what the hell is going on here? This is a goddamn lecture in Neuro the Theological School, not a frigging dissertation on crowd control and the MBTA. <laughs> Bear with me. There is a connection. People interference. At the beginning of the 20th century, the ratio of civilians to combatants killed in any given war was one civilian to eight combatants. At the beginning of this century, the ratio was eight civilians to every combatant. In war, the safest place to be is in an army. People have gotten in the way of war. They're a goddamn nuisance, collateral damage, people interference with the payloads that technologies of war had perfected. All humans were being asked to do was to show people that had a little respect for the way high-tech weaponry was used, not buggered up by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, a drone that pilots less pimpernel, serenely caressing altitudes of 37,000 feet, silently launching its lethal missiles of death, raining down oblivious and oblivion is a goddamn work of art. In fact, if people hadn't kept getting in the way of whimsical war weaponry for the last 100 years, the casualty of war might not look so bad, but they are bad. At the lower boundary estimate of 167 to 275 million people. At the upper bound, 188 to 258 million, which could mean that one in every 16 people on this wee thing we call Earth were collateralized into damage that turned them into piles of worthless shit. I mean, a just God and all that eschatological meandering of the best minds of our time? Shit! Now the God wonder and myself have been living with each other in my head for a long time, and the opportunity to pin him down when he was out on one of his self-inflating street gigs was just too much to let slip by. So I jumped on him, no time for pleasantries, or how do you do this? He there! I modestly confronted him. I've been counting dead people, war dead, conflict dead, displaced dead, refugee dead, children dead, mothers dead, even the goddamn grateful dead. And things just get worse and worse, and here you are blathering about about the same old things, turn the other cheek, love thy neighbor as thyself, which you let me tell you, is not one of your better lines because a lot of us feel pretty shitty about ourselves, and a lot of us just plain hate ourselves. Why should we believe in you? And all this gobbledygook you spread around, which let me tell you straight to your out of this earth face, is the cause of much of our meretricious dispositions to kick each other's asses from here to eternity. You're supposed to be a just God. Where the hell is the justice here? He kind of made a half turn. Gave me that beatific smile of insufferable complacence he uses to sucker you into liking him. He he. Hold it there, young fella, he starts. I never said anything about being a just god. Fact is, I never said anything about anything. Just you folk who keep putting words in my mouth. It's you folk who created me in the first instance. And then when you screw up, if you'll forgive my ungodly language, you start yelling at me and think it's my fault. What do you mean, we created you? I mean, it's you to take the credit for everything, whether in six days or four billion years, whether it's evolution or natural selection or intelligent design. There you go again. I repeat, I take the credit for nothing. You guys give me the credit. You're a little twisted in your logic, young man. Just because you humans say in books you wrote, your Bibles and Korans and Torah and scriptures and gospels and other theological sophisms that I said this or that doesn't mean I said it. Remember all these books are mad written. They're books according to one fella or another. Always a man, mind you. Pretty telling that if I may say so. I mean, you think it's my fault that one in three Americans literally believe that I created the world in seven days? Now, if we could have a conversation here, 
let's get a few things straight because frankly I don't have all eternity to keep talking with you you're just one guy in a very long queue all with the same questions all trying to put the blame for all kinds of human insanity on my shoulders so let's come to the nub of things okay well, okay, but I gotta tell you, I don't like the drifter. You're already giving me the I'm in charge, buddy, and don't you forget a crap. Hey, first, let's set the record saying. As I said, you created me. That's right. You created me because you needed me in order to survive. All I am, really, is a tool in your survival kit. You had to create me. Your prefrontal vortex got a little bigger. And suddenly, one day, well, perhaps one million years or so, on your time clock, you got to the point where you became conscious of the fact that you were merely mortal. But one day, you're gonna die. And you are terrified. Of all the creatures that share your earth, you are the only ones who carry with you the knowledge that one day you will cease to exist. You just can't handle that. You can't imagine it. Can't imagine not being conscious of your own non-being. Go read Ernest Becker, The Denial of Death. So you created me to take the terror away. Because you guys, once your neurotransmitters began to hum, had to believe you were immortal. But once you draw on your last breath, you'd be whisked from here to there, wherever there is. Kind of like a Star Trek maneuver, a body and being transfiguration. This thing that you call the soul takes a trip. Was the body goes cold? A day trip? No. An eternity trip. A trip for all time. But this immortality thing is your gig, not mine. It's your ego thing. Just because you can't imagine yourself not existing, you came up with me and my many mansions in my father's house. You keep forgetting you're just a species. But once your brain got even better wired, once you got equipped with better neurotransmitters and the dopamines kicked in, you got language and thinking, and worse still, with your fractured perceptions, you began to create the past, to remember, to compare, to resent. And resentment skill. Then you had another problem. If you were here on Earth, you reckoned that surely you had to have a purpose. And this part of your wiring hasn't quite untangled itself yet. So you come up with the idea of meaning to get yourself out of your dilemma. You invented that dumbest of all questions that just keeps bugging you. Why am I here? You invented this whole existential despair garbage Postmodernism, one damn school of something after another. You guys, and I've got to say this, have invented the damnedest nomenclatures to describe the simplest of things. And all of them, I've got to tell you, I'm a bit partial to Sam Beckett. Loved that tart observation of his. Words stain my silence. What a choice of word, stain lingers on the tongue, conveying just the right degree of contempt. <laughs> Think what I'd rather be if the Vatican were to announce that my image had stained Veronica's veil. <laughs> I wish all of you who pray, simply pray these words, O oh Lord, please do not allow words to stain my silence. Hold it right there, Lord. Hold it right there. I don't like where you're going at all. You're not even trying to be fair. I mean, over the centuries, you might say since the beginning of time, the best minds have been pondering some mighty heavy stuff. I mean, way back before your time. I'm talking about the B.C. era, you know, before the Judea Christian version of you went retail. The best minds have been trying to come up with answers to that question. Why are we here? Easy on. Just because you're so cynical about yourself, or maybe you're self-deprecating with, or maybe it's just because I'm having a bad night. Please, please. Let me get what you guys call context out of the way, okay? Then you can have your say. 
well, okay, but we're supposed to be having a conversation. And it seems to me it's all one-way traffic so far. Now, there you go again. Can't keep that little ego in place, can you? It's all about you. You have important things to say. You can't blah, blah, blah. You humans sure test my patience. Questions, questions, questions. So let's back up. First, you create me. Then you go one step further. You come up with this notion of religion. You screw it up by dividing me into all kinds of me's. One me for each religion. I was Zeus, then Jesus Christ, then Muhammad, then Buddha, then Shiva. God, I could go on and on. There's the Christian me, the Muslim me, the Buddha me, the Hindu me, the Jewish me. But even all of these divisions couldn't satisfy you. You had to subdivide me. Catholic me, Protestant me. Methodist me, Presbyterian me, Shia me, Sunni me, Orthodox me, me is proliferation all over the place. Religions run wild, each with its own hierarchy of authority, each with its own set of entry rules, your individual beliefs, your rituals, your this and your that, etc., etc., etc. But now, this wasn't enough for you. Then you guys had to take it one step further. You had to start fighting each other over which me is the real me. Because each of you said your me was the real me, real, real me and that I had somehow given you guys the real rules of the game, the authentic roadmap to the hereafter. And you wanted everybody else to follow your rules. Your rules, mind you, not mine. I had nothing to do with this kind of tube followery and you, 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 you young fella, you came up with one particular odious brand of me, a brand I highly disapproved of, the Irish Catholic me. <laughs> I mean, you created a punishing me. You had me sending most of you to some nonsensical halfway house called Purgatory to stoke fires for an indefinite stay, and the worst of you to hell, which had some phantasmagorical combustible contraption spewing out hellfire for all eternity. I mean, is it burning fossil fuels? Using dirty coal? Nuclear power? Did anyone think about that? I mean, who makes this crap up? Jesus, forgive me. I don't usually call on myself with an exclamation point. But, 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 this is really heavy-duty stuff. You better believe it was. Confessions every week trying to figure out whether it was a venial sin or a mortal sin. You know what all that did to us going to bed every night knowing that if you died in your sleep it was 50-50 that you're going to go to hell for all eternity. <laughs> Well, that's okay with me because you lost me a long time ago. I don't believe in that skullduggery any longer. Happened for over 40 years now. There are a lot of us, you know, who have rid ourselves of all that garbage, even if the old residuals kick in now and then. It's because of the fear of you that was pounded into us, the priests, the brothers, the nuns, a whack of the strap, even for missing questions and catching them crosses. Who made the word God made the word? Who is God? God our Father and Heather, the Creator and Lord of all things. Man, you really got to me. You know that one point I was here at 7 o'clock bath every morning, doing the station of the cross three times a day, five rovers, and then the Special one, St. Anthony, St. Jude, St. Teresa, the little flower, the first Monday, the nine Fridays, and the Venus, I'll write a poem to you every day, gee, those poems. Yeah, some versions of me can get people into a lot of trouble. And if it's any consolation to you, I never took your stuff seriously. I mean, your poetry was pretty, pretty awful. I mean, really awful. Hold it there. I mean, I don't give a damn who you think you are, but literary criticism is something we humans reserve for ourselves. So oh, come on now. Don't be so prickly. Your stuff was all imitation. Francis Thompson, John Manley Hopkins, William Blake, William Wordsworth, Alfred Lord Thomason. You thought you would follow in their footsteps that you had the gift of the mystical. Really, it was all so maudlin. Remember the one that imitated Francis Thompson's The Hound of Heaven? Come on yourself, that's not fair. I was only 14 years of age, but I got rid of you. I threw all that shit away long ago, and for you, you've got a lot to account for. You could have done something about it. There you go again. I keep telling you, you created me. You Irish created that Irish me. And yet, you may have gotten rid of me, but why did you replace me, Martha? 
first there were the pints of Guinness and the interminable conversations about what? about me of course a pub philosopher dispensing yourself the diligent textbook of passionate nihilism then the switch to Jameson then Glenn Fiddick before you finally settled on Bushmills, Black Bush, as I recall, a distillery of the stuff gargled down your throat every day and every kind of pill you could have laid your hands on to top it off with. Always neat, straight up, right? No ice to dilute the purity of the malt. No contaminants. And then there was a quaint little joke. You told I had nauseam. When you asked for a bush straight up and the barman asked, Will it be a small one, sir, or a large one? And how you looked at him solemnly in the eye, and even more solemnly intoned, there is no such thing as a large whiskey. Ah, great crack, but you stole that one too. It was in your joke. Stole it straight from Flann O'Brien. Are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Now you've been one lucky human. And when I say lucky, I want you to remember the incredible number of occasions your lives was literally saved. Here in Boston, 40 years ago, when in a drunken blackout you drove off the ramp at exit 15 and the car spun three times on the highway before coming to stop an immediate strip. And you couldn't even remember the following day. And the Irish cops who got to the scene drove you home and not to station nine. And you didn't drive, had no driver's license. Oh, your arrogant little punk mantra. Oh, yes, we'll drive, but only when drunk. Right? And you did it again on Tampa, between Tampa and Clearwater, with your boot to the floor and your poor wife screaming between Tampa and Clearwater. Like a hyena being torn apart by a mauling line, and you spun out of control, right? And why? Because you wanted to see an episode of All in the Family with Barchie Bunker. <laughs> And in Durban, South Africa, when you inched your way across a hotel balcony, 16 floors up to get to the balcony of the room next to you, so you get another bottle of vodka with your girlfriend and the child who supposedly was your foster daughter, screaming her head off and crying like the baby she was on fire engines hauling up ladders, or when you regained consciousness about three in the morning, blood soaked outside your apartment in Cambridge with absolutely no recollection to this day of how you ended up there and what happened, that one nearly cost you your eye. And yet you rampaged on. Oh, yeah, my trouval went on the bleep, and you were swimming in clots of blood, or the colon cancer. I mean, young fella, you think all oh, that is just luck. Who do you think you are? Some kind of a black swan? No. So, what do you think of it? Well, I never said there was some power greater than myself. But it's not you. I can tell you that. Don't come backwards from me. And where did you come to? What I might ask the profound deduction that there just might be a power greater than yourself. And I'm not being sarcastic. Sarcasm is not part of the God repertoire. I told you. About that kind of Jesus Christ, God-like business. I go to meetings, AA and NA, and these have these 12-step programs, a spiritual program. If you practice these steps, you stay clean, and you come to believe that a power greater than yourself helps you stay clean and sober. Because you can't play, stay clean and sober on your own. That's where I got it from. It takes us away the fear of, ah, how magnanimous of you. The great you comes to the conclusion that you may not be in control of the universe but you can't control the people around you, or their behavior, or even what happens in the next 24 hours. A plane falls out of the sky near Buffalo, bingo. A plane falls into the Hudson, and a different kind of bingo. Swine flu, and what kind of bingo can we expect? And yet, even with these meetings and all the other stuff, you're still looking for meaning? No, wrong. I'm not looking for meaning. I'm looking for peace. Peace? Peace to yourself? Or peace for others? Well, maybe both. Get it for others, and maybe it'll work its way back to me. Well, that's kind of cocky of you. Hey, give me a break, for Christ's sake. Listen up now. 
I have to move to the next poor bugger who's been on hold and all the lines are flashing. You humans are the only species that preys on itself. Now, I know I'm repeating myself, but you won't find elephants preying on other elephants or tigers and tigers or cats and cats or dogs and dogs. I mean, I'm not denying the food chain. That's a different matter. Here I'm talking about turning on light. Only you humans do that and have been at it ever since you've got a bit ahead of the other creatures. And now you've even turned on Earth itself and it's getting mightily pissed off. You won't take it much longer. We might even see one of those seismic upheavals that settle things every half a billion years or so. I mean, half a billion years in your terms, in mine, just a nanosecond. Think of the Neanderthals, a run of 200,000 years and then puff, gone so. And in disguise, you haven't a clue what happened to a creature that lived parallel to you that could think and walk and yes, make weapons. We cannot stop the conflict. It's genetically encoded in Homo sapiens. Part of everyone's genetic composition back to the old dopamines. It's an incurable condition that afflicts only the human species. You can't eliminate it. It comes with being able to think and vocalize your thinking with a capacity to remember. You can't, kind, can't find a vaccine or a pill or any other kind of antidote. From your first pissy seedlings, you guys have been added sticks and stones, bows and arrows, swords and lances, rifles and machine guns, tanks and hand grenades, bombs and blitzes, atomic and nuclear bombs, handheld missiles, and now dirty nuclear bombs. One small bomb with a mere 0.1% of kiloton that you can send by Federal Express will level everything and everybody within a half a mile radius of Times Square instantaneously, just like that, bingo, over and out. The current arsenal of your extinctive dreams comes to 2,100 strategic nuclear weapons in the hands of five countries and between 23,000 and 32,000 tactical nuclear weapons in the hands of eight countries with 30 countries fighting eagerly at the nuclear cherry. Your greatest accomplishment as a species, your serene ability to wipe yourselves off the face of planet Earth hundreds of times over. And genocides, remember the Rwanda one, man, those who do are enjoying themselves, getting together in their villages every evening to celebrate the number they had killed communal dancing and singing and celebration, high the kite and the lust of blood, only the arms are wretchedly tired from boots from swinging and hacking and hacking and hacking that machete all day, every day, until sheer exhaustion set in. Until the arms went limp, too tired to swing the machete one more time. I know, I know, nothing there that I don't know. We're all mightily impressed that you can roll off those statistics. So what's the point? I mean, you're beginning to sound a bit like me, if your godly present will forgive my no doubt impertinent comparison. Listen up, son. As a species, you're addicted to violence. Anywhere, anytime, by any means. One on one, group on group, color on color, language on language ethnicity on ethnicity, religion on religion, and when all else fails, self-killing. Suicide bombers, the willing to kill yourself so you can kill others. You can't stop the violence, can't end conflict, and ever have people not killing one another. Not ever. But you can learn to manage it. You can go to society steeped in conflict and do what you do in your NA or AA group. You can try and get people from what you call divided societies together to share the narratives of their conflicts with each other. 
Yeah, you're an addict. And you know what it's like. You can never be cured, but you can get into recovery by sharing your experience and meetings with others. You can find out that you're not alone. You get a sponsor, a fellow addict, who becomes your counter self. By practicing simple steps and altering addictive behaviors, you can earn yourself lasting recovery. Lasting, but not permanent. Only for so long as you follow the rules of the game. You guys support each other. You set up a buddy system. What do you call, call it sponsors? Your groups can do for you what you can't do for yourself. They keep you clean and sober, right? Right. The group is more powerful than you are, right? Right. If you ever forget that, you're done for, right? Right. Now as the guiding principles, addicts are in best position to help each other, right? Right. Here are a few hints. You addicts have a whole set of behavioral characteristics that set you apart from normal people. When you share with each other, you find, he, I thought I was someone special, that I had a problem like nobody. And then you go to a meeting and bingo, you find you're not alone. But you, the special you, is no different from every talking in the room. So, well, I think you should try to apply that idea to people from deeply divided societies. Don't they have special behavioral characteristics? Yeah. And don't they call their conflict special, that no one can really understand it except themselves? Yeah. And aren't their conflicts the last thing in the world they want to give up? Yeah. And don't they do the same thing over and over again? The same kind of bombings, the same assaults, the same bombings, the same door-to-door -door house searches, the same arbitrary executions, and every time they expect a different result. Right? Right. Well, what do you call that? Doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result? Insanity. And who are they just like? Freaking addicts. Right? Right. Well, I've got to go now. I don't want to leave you with a parting toast. Yeah. Please, don't stain my silence with words. Thank you.